You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. Hey, Jeeples. Welcome to another strange episode of On the Trail with Kevin and Scott, where we definitely take our Jeeps way off-road, off-trail, and off topic regularly. I'm Kevin, you know, the engineer, the general Jeep tech guy. I'm the guy who uh, uh, actually gets the instructions, um, reads them, and uses the right uh, tools. (laughs) And I'm Scott. I'm the slapstick parts guy, aka Beaker, (laughs) that doesn't read the instructions, doesn't follow them, unless they blow off the workbench and I go chasing it, going, no, 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 get back here. And then Kevin going, Scott, their instructions, I can't hear you. (laughs) On a continual mission to ruin and derail this man's poor train of thought. <laughs> so on that, while we will share what worked with us we and what didn't, it's really up to you. Uh, you, you, you know, do what you want, but uh, do your research, please. Um, as I recommend, at least, read the instruction. And Scott, please follow them. Yeah, that, at least he's got that part down. Please follow <laughs> them. Um, so, <clears throat> here we are on show 90. Um, <laughs> Pre-recorded. And... and <laughs> Pre-recorded early. And Just like you, Live you, PD, pre-recorded earlier. Yes, and, and as you saw, if, if, for those of you who heard our tire side chat earlier, um, yeah. you'll know why. But otherwise, that subject is verboten. Yes, verboten. Verboten. Um, what we're going to talk about now is probably something just about as drastic. Jeep gladiators. Oh, boy, yeah. <laughs> yeah my inbox got flooded with that. Hey, are you part of the recall? We'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> Getting tagged in the bent frame pictures. No. <laughs> you know. So, just a refresher for those of you who just crawled out from under the uh, uh, self-quarantine rock. <laughs> or worse at the oh, moment. The world could be ended right now. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Scott, uh, about, what, two months ago? January 31st. Okay, so more like three <laughs> months ago. <laughs> Yeah, you did. Uh, about three months ago, uh, Scott's family acquired a brand new 2020 or Jeep. 2019. No, 20, 2020 Jeep 2020 Gladiator. 2020 Jeep Gladiator Rubicon. Rubicon. Of course it would be. Okay. Of course it has to be, Mr. I'm going to buy a Ruby no matter what. Uh, Damn right. <laughs> it is written and, on my uh, shirt somewhere. You know, when we... Uh, uh, we did the show at uh, Jeep and with Judd. Uh, we talked about it, but it wasn't there. It was too new to yeah. even get dusty. It, it was in North Kakalaka. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so let me ask you something. Mm-hmm. Now, how many times have you actually gotten to drive the Gladiator? A handful of times, not like about 10 times. How many times have you gotten to drive it without your significant other in the other seat? About seven times. Seven times. Yeah. Okay. gunner has been in the passenger seat more than I have. <laughs> Guy the trail dog. <laughs> so you could, he's got some experience with the gladiator. Oh yeah, he does, and also trail drool down the entire side. <laughs> Guy the drool dog. But yeah. Yes. Uh, for those of you, uh, here, here's an unpublished tidbit about gladiators. If you have a drooling dog in the back seat and you have the oh no, the, he's in the front seat. Well, no, when he uh, Jory told us when he's in the back seat and you have the roof panels off, the drool will actually fly upwards on the off dra- of the updraft yeah, the and then out the back side of the truck, giving a Surprise to those following you going, yeah. no, it was supposed to rain. What the heck, dude? That guy got his wiper washers on. God damn, I'm getting like a little liquid on my. Oh, it, it smells like kibbles. <laughs> so it's got some interesting aerodynamics. So let's uh, let's start off with Scott. How do you like your gladiator? You know, here's the deal, and and I've said this a lot, and everyone kind of looked at me like I had lobsters crawling out of my ears, but it's the truth. Is that. I'm sorry. I'm still a big fan of the 3.6 and that eight-speed transmission because I went to get, I went to get gas the other night with it, and um, I pulled out of the uh, campground and left-hand turn gave it the beans, and she moved. She moved very well, and I'm like, oh, this is like the Charger all over again. Which, by the way, folks, he had a Charger with the eight-speed transmission and with the, the 3.6, 6, and I love that car. It, it, it moved, mm-hmm. but it rides so nice, and the the the, the um, uh, feeling of speed is so different in that truck because you know when we drove it home, mm-hmm. it's like. Like, you know, I told Dory, Dory, why are you doing 90s? I'm doing 75. Like, what? It just feels like you were hauling in that thing. Mm-hmm. But again, not having driven a JL, um, again, we covered a lot on the last show, but having lived with the Gladiator a little bit, seeing some of its quirks, mm-hmm. um, I still love it, man. It still is a great purchase. You know, great timing, but um, <laughs> it's still... It, it, 
I don't regret it. You know, it's not it's not a full size truck. Again, it wasn't never meant to be. No, it's a mid size. But as far as a Jeep goes and the capability, we've already you know, had a bunch of stuff in the bed already. Um, you know, it, it carries two of our tr- recumbent bikes just fine. You know, it, it actually is really really nice. I mean, I, I will give Fiat Chrysler. You know, uh, kudos. They did their homework, and it is a joy to drive. Okay. Any issues that you've had in the three months? No. Nothing. I mean, the, the start-stop <clears throat> battery went dead, but that's a common issue. And? And it's just a trip to the dealership. It's under warranty, and they take care of it. You know, basically okay. what it is is it, it the, the start-stop 12-volt battery is a known problem. So it's a my, small, de- 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 it, basically the plates break, I think, and it goes yeah. bad in a hurt. And you don't have the start-stop feature. Mm. Oh, darn. <laughs> I'd have that button turned off anyways. <laughs> we're still averaging almost uh, twenty or 17 to 18 miles to the gallon. And in we're a filling, truck. Yeah, in a truck. And Dory drives a little bit to work. And it's most, mostly highway. Mm-hmm. And she can go two weeks on a tank. In the JK, it was once a week. Well, that's uh, that's a nice that's considerable. surprise. And I noticed that uh, you've been talking about when you went to your storage unit back and forth a couple of times, you're no longer having to grab the little trailer every time. No, and that also, I was able to sell the trailer. Yeah. And that was nice. But again, it, it living with it, and again, with the quirks, the soft top is so much easier to live with. I mean, with, with the JK soft top and doing those lips and, and, and uh, or the, uh, with the, 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 the soft little plastic top, flip under, flip lips or whatever they yeah. underneath there, they, they got away with that. It, yeah. it, it's, it has a shock absorber, uh, uh, not a shock absorber, but a uh, lift support mm-hmm. to make it easier for her to do it. And she can operate the top by herself. It's just the two mirror clips and folds it back and doom, you're done. So it's almost like an automotive kind of a soft top. It is so much easier. And she is so happy with it. And even Gunner, like I said, he's all happy back there with his, his uh, wet stream of drool stream flying. Of drool flying around. But I mean, the, the, the cool thing is, is that a lot is of Is that people, an EPA regulated discharge? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> but one of the cool things is a lot of people do stop and ask us. Yeah. You know, hey, was it worth it? You know, what do you think of it? What do you like it? And... I think it's great. I, I I still, again, I'd like to drive it more. Mm-hmm. Who wouldn't? Yeah, but but it's her Jeep right now. It's her Jeep, and and it, it what the cool thing was is it got her excited for jeeping again. Oh, that's great, and that, that that's the really cool part. And I'm learning so much on these some of these forums about the Jeep, and I actually have to give a little shout out because. Um, when I saw someone asked me if Off Road Plus, if that was a thing just specific to the um, Mojave edition, mm-hmm. I said yes, and I proceeded to get ripped apart online. <laughs> and I'm like, and they're like, no, it's part of a Rubicon. I'm like, really? And they're like, what? Yes, it's part of Rubicon. And then if, I, I, some guy saying, this is how false information starts. You should be ashamed. And people go like, like, like flaming me online. I'm going, I guess you're right. So I put a post on there saying, you know, here you are, me and you talk about how we do should do your research, read the instructions. I'm a big proponent. How many times have you guys heard me say, read the owner's manual? I haven't read the owner's manual yet. So here I am answering your question simply and off the top of your head off the top of my head and, and i actually had to put on the uh, the muavi edition where yeah. it said it has off-road plus mode and what it does yep and say so here guys here's the article i just you know, sheepishly kind of posting it going i just read this article and it talked about how i assumed it was this only so i took a picture of the dashboard yep. which at night looks like darth vader's bathroom yeah there's all these buttons <laughs> i'm gonna take a picture of it it's like oh my god like like the JK is like, you know, you push the AC button on, that's it. Yeah. There's so many switch dobs and dials. No joke. It looks like I'm fighting a, flying a TIE fighter right now. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so I, I look down and sure enough, there's Off-Road Plus. <clears throat> I'm like, hot damn, they're right. So I put a picture on there going, well, you guys are right. <laughs> you know, because I own up to my mistakes. You know, we talked about oh, what works yeah. for us, what didn't. I owned up to it. Still don't know what it does, but I did read the owner's manual and found out about the um, maintenance schedules, which is really concerning. Oh, what's that? Well, the JK, every 30,000 miles, you're supposed to do the transmission flush. Mm-hmm. Okay. 100,000 miles coolant, 100,000 mile plugs, yada, yada, yada. 160 on the plugs. Yeah. That's concerning. Why? Well, that's a maximum <clears throat> number. You could go it sooner than that if you wanted to. I, I know. But it is the, the, the transmission is what we call in the automotive industry a fill for life. Mm. And like what was in my charger. It was very similar. For those in the Toyota world, know about world standard fluid. Yes, world do. standard fluid is you do not flush it. Mm-hmm. It's not meant to be serviced. Mm-hmm. You drive it till it goes bang, and then you replace it, fix it, fill it, have a nice day. Mm-hmm. There is no service interval. The Gladiator, which I'm very certain is the same as the JL, is a non-serviceable transmission. 
which makes me wonder about the four wheel driving and going off roading and mudding and all that. I'm like, Ugh. well, there's a theory behind that, Scott, and that is by it being a fill for life, it's a sealed system, and it should not be able to be contaminated. Shouldn't. Yeah. I'm putting it that way. You hear me say that, Chrysler. Yeah, yeah. Shouldn't. Yeah, shouldn't. Uh, however, you know, I would wonder too. You take a hot transmission, do a cold water crossing. Mm, something's got to give. Something somewhere. So we're going to have to, if, if Dory will ever let us borrow it for a half a day to actually open the hood and look. Mm-hmm. But she, she's no like. Dipstick. Yeah, well, I'm looking for the vent. Oh, yeah. how is the how is the transmission vented? Mm-hmm. Um, if it has a decent sized transmission vent and it's you know to the inside of the cockpit or something like that or into the in, intake system, you know it might stand a chance. And and this is one of those we've got to see where where it takes us. Maybe it is a good thing. Yeah. Or maybe it isn't. Maybe it's going to be one where you can buy a little kit in not too distant future and you cut into one of the two transmission cooler lines and you put a, <laughs> a service port <laughs> right you know for the flush fill. Um we had way back when we had one of the the Toyota Highlanders with the uh, fill for life uh mm-hmm. trans uh, transverse drive transmissions and it ran absolutely fantastic to about 125,000 miles and it started doing funky stuff and i was like well <laughs> it was cute. great to the day it doesn't and we didn't even bother getting it replaced we just traded in the vehicle yeah. let that be somebody else's problem uh <laughs> so well that's cool so that's something that uh, we didn't know about before so that's good to to pass on to those that are considering the uh, um the Gladiator uh, yeah. as their next Jeep purchase. And I also did realize something else, too. In Jeep Informant, we talked about how the, the Brian, I think it is, or Brad, he does like all the JL videos. Mm-hmm. Apparently, you know, we, we all know about the head issues with the uh, 3.6 and the uh, JKs. Mm-hmm. And that was had, the early series of engines. It's not yeah. in the laters. And they had a situation with uh, hardened um, camshaft lobes. Yep. It's still having some problems. There's a couple of the... Cry, uh, of the um, the caravans or something like that. One of the, one of the smaller mm-hmm. cars. I don't know the exact name. It's on one of his videos, Jeep Informant, on YouTube. And he, it's one of the Chrysler. I think it was a Chrysler 200. I think it was, and it had it chewed up the cam. And mm-hmm. he's like, "This is very disturbing." They were supposed to fix this because I guess now instead of being a VTI, it's a variable valve type. It's, it's a VVTI now. Yeah. And they also added an EGR cooler. They've also added a couple other things that that the 3.6 in the uh, Charger did not have. Yeah. So I, I walked into this thinking it was the same. It's, Go, it's not, a late, they tweaked it. Well, the issue with the camshafts um, in almost every case has been a failure of either heat treating or the nitride treating of the surface. It hardens the surface of that cam lobe to resist wear. Mm-hmm. And is, that surface is supposed to be several thousandths thick if for some reason in the batch it did not get hardened correctly, it is not going to last long. Oh, gee, it's like a, like a, a precursor of a subject to come later. Yeah, maybe. Um, so that's that's not a design issue in as much as it's a manufacturing issue. Yeah. And even if you fix it once, if somehow the process quality control fails, it could happen again. So yeah. most likely Fiat Chrysler has a, a vendor supplier problem for that particular part of their uh, assembly. I don't know whether they manufacture it in-house, the camshafts. I kind of doubt it. Yeah. Um, and uh, we'll see how they handle it under warranty. As we've always said, you know, good isn't how good you, uh, you know, good isn't about how good your product is. It's how good you are when you have a problem with your product. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's really what defines a good manufacturer because everybody's going to have problems sooner or later. Yeah. Um, the EGT cooler, all I can think of is like my Ford 6.0 turbo diesel. Yeah. Those you're going to have to watch for buildup. Um, I don't believe that the, uh, Gas engine's going to have the same level. You don't a, a good gas engine running good quality fuel. You know is not going to put out the soot levels that a, even the best diesel yeah. <laughs> spits out into that EGR cooler. <clears throat> so if that's an issue, it's still not bad. EGR coolers have their purpose, right? Um, what that really means, if they're adding an EGR cooler to it, is they needed to get some exhaust gas recirculated into the intake 
because the engine power levels up to the point it was starting to create high temperature cylinders and creating nitro, you know, uh, NOx, NOx. Right, NOx Nit- gases. Yeah, nitro, sorry. Nitrous oxide? No, that's laughing gas. Oh. Yeah, but oxide of nitrogen, of a thing like that, it's the stuff that helps make acid rain. Sorry, guys, I'm, <laughs> no, I'm having fine. a tired day. <laughs> we've, been, we've been a long day, a long couple of weeks, actually. But Yeah, well, this, but, well, this morning we put on 42, 40, 42 feet of uh, steel roof on yeah. a barn. <laughs> that was kind of fun, you know. It was like, Scott, you want to go up there? Like, no, I am afraid of heights. I'll, I'll wear the gloves and hand you the sheet metal. <laughs> and Scott's handing us up nine-foot-long sheets of uh, my three-foot-wide sheet steel roofs. Uh, yeah. A couple of, oh, let's just say... Uh, Older generational guys who are up walking. <laughs> the, oh, like, how does it feel to be a rotisserie chicken? <laughs> what? Nothing. You need some water? <laughs> it was hot up there. Unfortunately, yes. we were doing the, the morning facing roof. <laughs> so, of course. Uh, but anyway, um, it, everything was kind of good. I, I truly enjoy it. I mean, well, it, it, that's great. I'm learning more. I read, like I said, read the owner's manual, got that information. Uh, again, so it's got great highway manor, manners, good uh, yeah. drivability. You guys really haven't taken it off road yet, other than just kind of into the gravel. I haven't had time unfortunately okay so we're still waiting for a report on off-road capabilities as soon as dory gets over the first scratch i know she <laughs> panicked on that and had a meltdown so well that's someone being rude and opening their car door into that thing so yeah, I know. And that's why we want to look at uh, getting some uh, rock slide engineering hi guys yeah, um, some side some, some yes. side steps and side armor go ahead open your door into my armor i don't <laughs> care <laughs> That's how we were with the JK. I was like, yeah, go ahead. Open your door fast. I don't care. Bang. <laughs> sucks to be you. Now, all of a sudden, it's whole crud. Aluminum doors. Sucks to be us. <laughs> so there's another thing. The doors are a little lighter to take off, oh, but you hood. haven't done that yet. Yeah, the hood, the doors, and the tailgate are supposedly aluminum. Aluminium. Aluminium. Okay, Jeremy Clarkson. <laughs> <laughs> but well, that, no, that's that's awesome because firsthand experience for the rest of us out there looking at you know Jeep's first attempt at a pickup truck in what uh, forty years? Yeah. Well, should we segue to the frame conversation yet? Well, and that's where <laughs> I was going with this was not all the published information has been quite as rosy as your experience has it scott you know i get tagged in the fifth thing every time it's like hey scott you see this i'm like yeah i see the guy with an off-road camper that the lift was improperly installed and the bumper jounce caused like a, 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 their their explanation you've all seen it same yeah. picture with the colorado yep you know if you take mm. any and this one guy said you know this is ridiculous this thing should handle this kind of abuse blah 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 and i said okay you pump the brakes there hannity just because it's trail race it doesn't mean it's indestructible. Well, you know, for that much money, they should do it. And I'm like, and Kevin, you had a great point about this thing. You know, if, 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 if it was engineered to take that kind of punishment. Well, we, a Jeep could build something that would take everything you wanted, but you, you ended up looking like... Uh, um, Kenny Abrams. Hawks, uh, <laughs> K- Kenny Kenny Hawks pit bull, uh, pit bull yeah. is six by six and cost two hundred and eighty thousand dollars. I don't think it'd be that cheap, uh, and and that's definitely a thumbs up to Kenny's build quality because he builds things that you just watch him and Moab. <laughs> Other guys are sitting there screaming, tire smoke bouncing, bending. You hear thunks and. They make it up over this ridge, and he just kind of goes, blub, 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 and blub, just crawls blub, up and like crawls another. right up it like it's some sort of a mechanical, you know, warrior going. Yeah, but when the tires are the size of shopping malls, I mean, what do you expect? But you want it to be in the, <laughs> exactly. You know, you know? So the point is, to any of you who want the indestructible off-road vehicle, go see Kenny. I'm sure he'll build one to you for a phenomenal fee. And the thing that really <laughs> got me is the person that made that comment yeah. had a fully built JK. Now I wanted to, I almost wanted to say well I have a question take your stock JK and go out there and beat it on the the trails you see every day well it won't make it yeah. That's because you made it your own and built the way you wanted to and found the weaknesses and worked around them The point is I guess what Scott's trying to make is the uh for Jeep to bring a truck out, okay they had to walk a line between what the world expected and wanted in terms of a vehicle they drive every day and off-road capable. All right. If you build the off the ultimate off-road vehicle at a and that price point, you're gonna lose a lot of the people they need to finance the vehicle. All yeah. right. We had this discussion quite a while ago when we went to uh, um, SEMA. Yeah. And we actually talked to Chrysler's representatives there. And they had that lovely little uh, Gladiator two door. Remember that, Scott? The one they want him to build, the two door. Everybody cabinet. wants to do, you know, the beautiful little blue uh, unit. <clears throat> and they admitted that here's the problem 
it's not financially feasible to build it. Right. Because their market wants four doors. Mm -hmm. Um, and, And folks, they're talking about you and me. Most of us out there, you know, there, there's a hardcore group of us that like two doors. I get it. But we're in the minority. Yeah. The rest of you listening are going, yeah, I like my four doors. And I understand that. You got kids. You got stuff you want to carry. You got dogs like Scott. Yeah. You know, having back doors is great, you know. Um, the downside is back doors and a bed kind of make this hellacious bending moment. <laughs> and when you take and add a couple of thousand pounds off the, the back end and then try and crown the thing across, you know, a bunch a, of sand a, dunes, a bunch of sand dunes, it's going to bend. Yeah. Um, There's always more to that story when you see the picture. There is a lot more when you read it. Um, 10 to one, he try was trying to catch air mm-hmm. uh, and something has to give. Now, it's interesting that the frame bent as opposed to the hitch breaking. So tantamount, I would rate your hitch pretty dang high, whatever hitch you had on there. Well, also, um, the, the way that the frame bent was less, almost like it was a dump bed. Yeah, that's what now, I'm talking about. Now, from accidents, I know that is a force being pushed. Yeah. Okay, pushed and down. So maybe he would hit a sand dune with that trailer. Now, again, okay, that trailer weighs 2,000 pounds. 2,000 pounds going 35 miles an hour. Is a lot of force. Is a lot of force. To come to a sudden stop. I have had in my body yeah. shop Tundras, F three fifties, F two fifties, F what name the truck. Very similar damage, damage when it hits something. Yeah. And he could have nosed into the sand dune, bringing it to a stop. And everybody said, well, it would have crumpled the front end. No, actually, a sand bed doesn't do that. No, it acts like a big thing of marshmallow <laughs> fluff in a way. And it kind of sucks the energy out of the front of the truck, but you still have all that mass in the back. And we're not saying that's what happened. I'm right. just saying that could have been what happened. The point is the frame bent. Mm-hmm. Now, from an engineering perspective, that's what it's supposed to do, folks. Yeah. They got out. He can complain about it. He's uninjured. Okay. Start thinking about the amount of force necessary to take that <clears throat> basic uh, gladiator frame and bend it in the middle like a playing card. Yeah. Okay. Yet he walked away. It did its job. It did its job. That's what it's supposed to be. Today, vehicles are built to crumple. They're, the, the, They're designed to, to deform self-sacrifice. and self-sacrifice to protect you. Yeah. All right. Um you all I have to do is go back and historically look at some of the 1940s, 50s, and 60s accident <laughs> You're fatalities. You're the squishy bit in the middle. Yeah, you are the energy absorbing barrier. Yeah, and ni- um, you like that nice steel dashboard, don't you? Nice and shiny. <laughs> yes, and then the steering that was linked <laughs> with a steel rod that basically went from the driver's front wheel to your heart. Yeah, in a nice little uh, chrome metal <laughs> spiky cap, and the steering wheel was uh, 22 inches in diameter. Well, yeah, so it had three small bars. I think just like voomp. It's like you Superman into the steel spike into your your, your chest. Yes, yeah. Um, and nowadays that kind of construction is not smart and not legal. So yeah. you you design vehicles with crumple zones. You design people vehicles to absorb energy as part of their uh, failure mode. So if you have exceeded the design parameters of the vehicle for operation, you now move into that Deformation zone is what yeah. they call it, and that's abuse. That's considered abuse. That that I won't candy coat it. That is not manu- That is not a defect in manufacturer warranty. Now, yeah. people go, well, they got the new Mojave edition. Now, the Mojave edition is the frame is different. It mm-hmm. is reinforced in certain areas for sand dune running. But guess what? Certain areas, certain areas. But you can only tow four thousand pounds. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, it's not a give and take. I mean, we all want the hybrid SUV vehicle that's got a V8 with 0 to 60 um, times of 2.8 seconds. And 40 that, miles per gallon. That, no, 102 miles per gallon that costs 38 cents and a half-eaten bag of Funyuns. We all want that. But it doesn't exist yet. I'll pay $2.38 for one. No. Ooh, you shine on, you crazy diamond, you big spender, you. But, uh, so, you know, I, in, in this case... We did learn something, though. What I, I look at those things and go, okay, let's get past the, the no pun intended, bent feelings, oh. <laughs> uh, and uh, look at it. And, okay, we now know one of the failure modes for a gladiator. Yeah. And that is it will bend in the middle. It will bend at the back of the cab and front of the bed area, mm-hmm. which makes sense as a designed weak part because people don't 
sit or ride in that location. Right. So I would look at that as, okay, that means that it's a well-designed vehicle from a safety perspective. Right. Now, it also tells me that if I'm going to go out there and do crazy stuff with it, that's a spot that I'd probably want to address address and beef up. And some people have. They've cut from that cab on back and made their own for a why logically the beep beaker suspension system. Yeah. And they've, and they've beefed up the frame in that area to move yeah. where the forces are applied as well as stiffen them. The downside to that for those people, and this goes for all of us to make changes, is we are compromising the designer's intended safety performance yeah. for that. Uh, and therefore, the next time something like that happens, the Jeep won't bend and you may not walk away. Yeah. It may be nice and straight, and you may be in there with a broken collarbone or and a, worse. A, a, a ruptured ne- a disc in your neck. Yeah. But be that as it may. Um, so what else have you seen in the gladiator world that's biting you and nibbling oh, at your backside? Well, this this actually has been a very hot topic. And my only complaint is this. And this this is kind of more on my, uh, because I'm in the, as some people would call the stealership world, mm-hmm. um, the recall on the clutch Oh, oh, sorry, the transmission issues or whatever. Well, it's it's all over the place as far as what you see on the write-ups. And one of the things that someone said, and some of the things a lot, and again, I understand you just spent $40,000 on a truck. I understand you're upset. I understand you ordered one and you can't take delivery because it's a stop sale. Mm-hmm. You know, why can't I order a stick shift now? The list goes on and on. And one other person went on a long diatribe about how this is, this is ridiculous and unacceptable that... They've had the vehicle for 4,000 miles, and they got the recall notice, and then they always said the, the, the clutch act kind of funny, mm-hmm. and it did. And so they basically said, look, we don't have a fix for it right now. It's okay to drive. You know, We will call you when the parts are available. Now, the, the chain of command on a recall is when, when the, the, the NAT, what is it, NHTSB allow National USB? National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, NHTSA. Those guys. Basically, the chain of command is that they recognize there's a problem, and the manufacturer goes, yep, we have a problem. Now, when you get a recall issued, that's to let you know and inform you that there is a recall on your vehicle. Mm-hmm. Nowhere in that recall does it probably say, some are different, mm-hmm. we have all the parts in stock, bring your vehicle, we're going to fix it for free absolutely 100% every time. That is the follow-up <clears throat> repair notice. Right. And basically, what it is right now, they have <clears throat> Chrysler is working on a solution. And mm-hmm. this person thought, you know, they, they, I, I, need, I need you to fix my vehicle right now. It doesn't feel right. One of the person on there said, well, what do you want them to do? Put the same parts that are going to fail on your vehicle now. It takes time to engineer a solution, to engineer the, and make the parts. Hello, we have this little thing going on in the world right now, so you're just going to have to be a little patient. Well, I'm worried about fire. Well, they carry a fire extinguisher. And their reply was, are you, are you kidding me? You're telling me my car could catch fire and I'm going to you carry a fire extinguisher? I'm going to get a lawyer. Okay, to do what? To do what? You know, this is a product <clears throat> recall. There are laws set up exactly for a product recall. There is a reasonable amount of time to address the situation and determine the correct fix. Yes. Um, you know, it, it, let, let's back up, and I'm, I'm going to wind back from an engineering perspective because, you know, that's my side of the role. Exactly. Uh, first off, I keep seeing everybody going, oh, it's this piece of crap transmission. Uh, stupid Fiat. Yeah, stupid Fiat and other things like that. Number one, it's not the transmission that's failing. Correct. It is the same transmission that's been around for quite a while. The Well, we're not absolutely sure okay. uh, which transmission it is. <clears throat> but that is not the failure mode. What is happening here, folks, is the pressure plate in the clutch assembly is cracking under high heat situations. Now, I'm going to tell you, I've worked on clutches uh, and cars back to the, you know, I don't (laughs) go back to the 40s, but I've worked on 40s model cars. Mine's currently slipping. (laughs) Okay. And by the way, Scott, that generates heat. (laughs) I know. Trust me. And it's not uncommon to pull clutches off, clutch uh, pressure plates off that have heat cracks. That's actually considered somewhat normal to have these radial fine cracks. Well, what is happening in the Gladiators, Wranglers, uh, the material, the the, uh, pressure plate casting material is not surface fracturing. It's fracturing into pieces. 
And under extreme, and I've got to use the word extreme heat, you know, you guys out there uh, doing jackrabbit starts, slipping the clutch, pulling heavy loads, creating a lot of heat in the clutch, um, it is actually causing the pressure plate to fracture and come apart. Right. And I don't know the exact uh, makeup. They're usually the pressure plate is it can be cast aluminum with a steel facing, or it can be all cast iron or cast steel. Right. Um, and uh, I'm guessing it's probably um, cast steel. Usually more they the are common be, because the mass. You want, you want a mass. big mass behind there. That's kind of part of your flywheel uh, mass. And when it cracks, of course, it's spinning. Sometimes upwards of 3,000 RPM. 3, plus RPM. The centripetal force takes those pieces, and the pictures I've seen online, uh, first off, pretty the, devastating. The, the clutch is very hot at this point. That's yes. what caused it to fracture. So it's probably upwards of, I don't know, anywhere from 500 to 1,000 degrees. Well, now you also have these big chunks of hot steel spending at 3,000 RPM in an aluminum bell housing. Yeah. It doesn't hold it, it comes blasting out of that bell housing and just goes through it like a shell. And what's beyond the bell housing in your gladiator, Scott? Yeah, you have, uh, all kinds of little yeah. uh, hoses, lines, your drive shaft, your foot floorboard. Well, the drive tunnel, like you said, the gas lines, the brake lines, the electrical wires, the vent hoses. If one of those goes through, let's see, gasoline tends to be a little flammable under heat. Uh, brake fluid. Maybe a little bit of brake fluid under heat. Uh, I almost transmission say, fluid. Well, I was going to say transmission fluid, but then I realized it's a manual, but there's still oil inside There's of still it. oil. So you have basic shrapnel, hot shrapnel flying around. At 3,000 RPM. It, you know, and yeah, it causes pretty nasty devastation. Mm-hmm. Um, so... How can you avoid it? Well, first off, if you smell burnt clutch, we all know that smell. The guy on the trail that's out there trying to climb the mountain with the old stick. <laughs> There's videos of a gladiator guy tied at 2,000 miles, took it off road, and smoke was just billowing out from under it. Okay. That probably got pretty hot. Yeah. Okay. But the key is, you know, if you've got smoke, burnt clutch smell, excessive pedal travel, stop driving it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Get it over to the dealership and have them look at it. Or tow it. Or tow it. Um, But in the meantime, while this, if you got the recall letter and everything's fine and you're like, what do I do? Just drive normally. Yeah. Don't go out there and jackrabbit and burn your clutch. Don't try to peel out and, you know, that's really not that you're adding heat to the situation. And also, you're also opening a case for abuse. Abuse. So, what's the fix? Okay, this is where, as I understand it, and I've got to put dot, 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 at the time of this recording, right. I understand that Chrysler is trying to determine, is it an actual design flaw or is it a manufacturing flaw of that component? All right. Either way, they're going to take care of it. They're going to take care of it. But you can see there's a big difference. If the review of the engineering says, no, this should have worked. This is perhaps the same casting we've used before. Why did it fail? Do we have bad materials or a bad manufacturing process? It's actually easier if they do find out there's a design error because you can correct the design and get right back into manufacturing the new parts. Right. Now, of course, what does that mean for the entire stock of inventory made with the old parts? That's now garbage. Scrapped. You know, uh, you, it, and you're like, well, I could take it apart and rebuild. Well, no, you can't. It's not cost effective. You basically scrap it all, and then you have to refill the entire supply line. And that's just not for new car manufacturer. That's for supply line to the parts. Correct. Um, so, you know, you've got this process that once you've decide, figured out what the problem is, come up with your corrected plan. You have to actually engage an entire new version of production line and bring it to bring just so that now we can take it down and call you and say, we've got the new clutches in. We'll replace yours. Right. If you absolutely positively cannot wait and don't care about warranty, I expect you could probably go buy an aftermarket clutch. Um, you know, maybe one of the high end. Now, I'm not even saying I know that they do this. Right. But like ACT level twos, clutches and things like that. The McLeod and, you know, all of these other uh, uh, companies, Center Force, I'm sure probably make replacement clutches to their specifications. Yeah. But you're also avoiding your warranty in doing so. Not only that, but also <laughs> if it is an engineering design flaw, you are, those clutches are sometimes 
reverse engineered off an engineering design flaw. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that brings a whole other question. And, 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 and not to take away from this person's... Um, oh, your frustration is frustration warranted. Is warranted. Your anger is warranted. warranted. But again, they can't just hand you another truck for free. No. And let you drive it until you get your truck fixed. Now, if that clutch smokes out and you smoke billowing and it is undrivable... Then you have a then they they have to give you a loaner. I'm yeah. sorry, and then then if they can't find a fix within 30 days, then lemon law rules may apply. Yeah. Each state's different. I'm just I I don't know the exact lemon law in their in their state or our state. So that is a question, a legitimate question to ask. Now I'm not saying go out there and burn your clutch up on purpose. Well, no, because yeah. they, they can, there's ways to tell that you did that, and that exactly. would be considered abuse, and then you won't get any clutch at all. And no warranty at all. So, so if you have a legitimate concern, you have a legitimate concern. Now, you know, the age-old squeaky wheel gets grease. I mean, that's true, but also, too, if you take it to that next level personally, mm-hmm. you know, it becomes a point where, again, right, wrong, or indifferent, this is the facts. It's a human being on the other side of that counter, Yep. and they're, they'll shut down and say, okay, we're done dealing with you. Fine. Take your vehicle somewhere else. Yeah. So as long as it goes, those of you with the, the manual gladiators and JLs, and if it just keep an eye on it, if it starts to smell funny, first off, did you get a recall notice? It's yeah. not all clutches. It's a production run, they say, from August 23, 2017 to February 13th, 2020. There's about just a tick under 30,000 Wranglers and only, only 3,419 gladiators. Right. That's not a big number, folks. No. All right. So if you didn't get a recall, you're probably fine. Yeah. No, <laughs> you know, uh, this is actually more to the JLs than it is to the gladiators, but it seemed to hit the news all about the gladiator. Yeah. We, we have that subject a lot lately. One of the things, too, that people don't understand is that on those parts, there's barcodes. And everyone, well, how do they know? Well, simple. The production run has a serial number. Mm-hmm. And before the car gets put on there, bloop, or the part gets put on the vehicle, bloop. And it goes on your it bill. It goes on onto the, onto the vehicle. So they can scan so they know what, because the, the parts person installing it, you know, may not know what they're installing, but that scan gun will tell them the options yep. of what's being put on that vehicle. Right. So again, it's one of those kind of things. And, and, and one other thing for the for the JL folks, I just want to clarify, even though it's from the build is from August 23, 17, it does not include 2017 JLs. Yeah, that is pre-production for 2018. So the recall is from 2018 to 2020 Wranglers, and then just 2020 Gladiators with manual transmissions, transmissions. Yep. not automatics. Correct. I shouldn't have to say that, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> I uh, don't have no left pedal. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah, that, that's uh, one of those things that happens. We, we've had plenty of things in the. Uh, in the Jeep world, the TJ even has growing pains with the oh. uh, the uh, OBD PM, whatever it is, the the oil on the the, the distributor Don't thing, remind laughing me. monkeys, whatever it is. Yes, yeah, I've been there. So yeah, that. everyone goes, they make these things like crap now. I can tell you right now, the TJ had its fair share of recalls. <laughs> we did, we did indeed, and, and I bought mine after the recall, so I wasn't covered. But fortunately, at that point in time, I was able to walk down to the local parts store and go, I need a a oil pump drive uh, <laughs> assembly, which we used to call a distributor because uh, it goes yeah. in the same hole the old distributor went into. Well, th- that's where I have my uh, the star scan. I went on and click, 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 and tied away and said, oh, look, that recall was done on mine. Yeah. Um, and for those of you who go, what is the laughing monkeys? You can Google it or, or you YouTube. can send me a thing, uh, an email, and I'll answer you. But yeah, the, the key here is there is a small number of of uh, Wranglers and Gladiators, about 35,000, which really in the total number of productions is a pretty small percentage, yes. uh, that have some sort of defective pressure plate. It's not the clutch. No. It's not the bell housing. It's not the flywheels. It's not the motor. It is the pressure plate, the squeezy part on the clutch <laughs> <laughs> that has some sort of a flaw. Right. Uh, as I said, this time where is no published data, whether it is a casting flaw, i.e. the material is, is fracturing just because it was poorly cast, whether it was improperly designed, incorrectly machined, we don't know. Yeah. Uh, we do know that it does give you warning in the form of messed up pedal travel and or overheated clutch smell right and driving normally has not shown itself to 
go uh, kibbutz just under daily driving. Yeah. Uh, unless your daily driving includes quarter mile runs from stoplight to stoplight. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing you don't have a stick shift because that'd be you <laughs> following you here to stay. I'm driving an automatic. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Left front tire come off the ground. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm trying to not burn my clutch out the rest of the way. Yes. Well, you, you, your, yours is burned out just because of miles. You know what? I think we're going to get right back to the Jeep with my problems here when we take a quick Sounds break. Sounds like it uh, works that way. All right. We'll be right back, guys. Hey guys, it's uh, Scott again after Kevin just had to remind me of something. Hi. Uh, I just want to take a few minutes to uh, remind you to check out all the shows on the 4x4 Radio Network and also to Mark from WranglerFits.com. For, did I say Fitz again? You did. I said Fitz again. I am so sorry, Mark. <laughs> uh, yeah, Scott, Scott, you know, I, I would wonder if he's been drinking, but he's just got a can of Coke. I saw him buy it. I know it hasn't got any rum in it, but uh, he getting his modes wixed. <laughs> exactly. So Mark from WranglerFix.com is our newest Patreon. So check Thanks, out the- Mark. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Check out the uh, pay, uh, check out his website for some uh, cool ECM stuff, and hopefully here soon he'll be a contributor. And also, too, as we've mentioned a couple times before, uh, we also have the Patreon page and our YouTube page. We kind of suspended videos for right now, but we'll get back to that soon. Enough. But yeah, I, I, and I promise, guys. I know I owe you one more trail ride from uh, uh, Jeeping with Judd, um, but just haven't had time. Yeah, a man can only handle so many of my fart jokes. So with that, we're gonna get right back to the action. And we're back. So uh, this is going to be kind of a weird garage segment because it's not really a garage. It's what's wrong with quantum entanglement now? (laughs) I don't know. That's kind of the start to every garage segment. That's the start to every one of our phone calls. (laughs) <laughs> hey, Kevin. Or hey, 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 Kevin. How you doing? Hey, Scott. What broke now? Damn so it. let's start off with the beginning. What have you fixed? Not replaced. No. What have you fixed <laughs> well, to this point? Well, since he's our, been very busy, boy. <clears throat> since our last recording, um, uh, the, the, since the tires were dated 2011, <laughs> it's 2020. Um, I know that. <laughs> so they know that. <laughs> I hope they know that. Unless the world ended. It's just because uh, you, you, you know, every time you came over here and parked on the driveway, I'm going, Scott. Would you finish your snap, crackle, and pop? breakfast before you come in <laughs> oh, we'll get to that in a minute so uh anyways uh, i've got new tires on uh i got, I got my dixie pick fun country twos what i had on the jk kevin bought a set for uh slightly altered and i said love you know them. i love these tires so much i got me i done got me a set yep but um one of the cool things what i thought what i would do is when just recently like a long time ago i was backing out of kevin's driveway and I hit the brake and he saw my whole axle go and he kind of stopped and gave me the the raised concern dad i <laughs> brow kind of look and i'm going you're getting ready to drive uh, back hi. with a defective jeep <laughs> hi uh, hi kevin he goes are you i said yeah i got the parts he goes how long have you had them in the garage uh nine months <laughs> he just shook his head so i had a monday off yes you and did. i said i'm gonna do good i'm gonna take off my transfer case drop mm-hmm. you know because the uh, the lj's from the rear drive shouldn't chef need shouldn't it. need them i did all that went for a test drive nothing broke or fell off everything's life's good okay now i'm gonna put on the front control arm bushings yeah Okay. Folks, let me let me put it to you this way: When you slid under his, he he has the solid tubular, no name lower bars, um, and the uppers were factory sheet metal bars that you could take the front of his Jeep and watch the bushings rattle around, kind of like a pinball. An eighth of an inch. <laughs> an eighth of an inch. Yeah, I mean, when, when, I, when, I, when I took it out uh, and, I, and I grabbed the bar and I went. And I could fit like a head of a pencil in between. I'm like, you know, yeah, they were they I, were just a wee bit loose. I didn't wonder if that was my wobble. <laughs> so uh, I'm getting new tires, like I said. So yeah. I'm like, I don't want to put worn components. I'm going to get an alignment anyways. Yada yep. yada yada. So I went ahead and put the new control arm bushings. Okay? It wouldn't have been an alignment with those bushings. It would have been a guesstimate. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So anyways, so I I I I had to do something that Kevin knows or doesn't know about, but <laughs> to to get. Because I didn't drop the Jeep. I'm doing this on my driveway in the campground. And I'm like, okay. So I took the bolt out. And, of course, everything shifts. Yep. And I'm like, okay. So I got the ratchet strap out, put it to the axle, put it to the bumper. (laughs) Pulled the bolt back in spot, put the bolt back in tight. Ouch. Typened it down. I I typened Typened it it down. down. (laughs) 
<laughs> Damn it. I done tap into down. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I, I did that and I went for my test drive and nearly died. <laughs> As I was sitting on the 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 the, the, G, the one out outlet of the campground is a big tall like tall hill, yep. and I can usually tell when I let my foot off the brake and stop it. You hear the cocoon of the axle moving. Mm-hmm. I didn't hear cocoon. I'm like, all right, cool. And now I'm all hot and ready. This to go. is after you replace the bushings. After I replace the bushings, so the, the the traffic was light. I'm like, all right, I'm going. First gear slip. Second gear slip. Third <laughs> gear didn't slip. Got into fourth gear. Got to 45 miles, and all of a sudden it was. It got so bad. I'm looking. I'm, I'm actually looking at my driver's wheel going left and right, left and right, left and right. Suddenly, I mean, it was jerking my. Yeah. I had to stop. Yeah. I had to stop. I had to pull. I'm like, oh, you son, bleep bleeping bleep 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 bleeping bleep bleep. You turn. No. You turn again. I'm going to do... Uh, you know what? I'm going to see if... You, I downshifted again. <laughs> First, second, got to 45 miles. Nah, 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 nah. I got to 50 and it uh, came right in with a smooth again. I'm like, okay, you can't drive through death wobble. Because death wobble gets so bad, you die. Yeah. <laughs> okay. If you death dr- wobble. And so I'm thinking, okay, 2011 tires. I've always had a shake at 50. Mm-hmm. Um, it's probably the tires. Now that everything's tight... It's it, just it's just broadcasting it right up through the right up through the steering shaft. So I go on the interstate, saying, you know, let, 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 let's give it let's give it the beans, man. I gotta get to work tomorrow. Here, and, here's a man with <laughs> well, I won't say he knows no fear, but one has to wonder when you ignore fear. But go ahead. So, anyways, <laughs> I got on the interstate, and the the cool thing is, without the transfer case drop, yeah, I lost the harmonic vibration at sixty miles an hour. Okay. I feel like I was going to die at any moment from the front end, <laughs> but I'm like, okay. And then I, I said, you know, I, uh, of course, I like we joke, yeah. Kevin, I broke it. What'd you do now? Kevin's like, it's your transfer case drop. Well, Kevin, I put the new, I, I it didn't happen until after the control arms. It's your transfer case drop. I put the transfer case drop back on. Mm-hmm. It still shook. But the next morning when I drove to work, mm-hmm. it didn't shake as bad, but mm-hmm. it still shook. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, I got a vibration here somewhere. I get an alignment done. It was way off. If, you, if you're on our Instagram, you can see the, the alignment was like all red. Yep. I had like 0.8 degree cam- negative cam- camber. So apparently my ball joints are worn. Gee, wonder why about that. Mm. Um, my toe was 63 off on one side and 36 <laughs> off on the other side. So my Jeep was pigeon toed. Yeah. You, you, you were knock kneed pigeon toed. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, all right. So I got the alignment done, mm-hmm. went, w- drove home, almost died again. So clearly it was an alignment. At this point, I'm like, okay, it's the tires. It's the tires. So I went ahead and got the tires replaced, and she rides a whole lot better. But at any minute, I feel like it's I'm going to die because I, I feel that, that shake every now and then. I'm like, oh, goodness, here it comes, and it doesn't happen. So I dropped down to 25 PSI with the new tires, mm-hmm. a lot better. I'm not, I, I still get the occasional shake here and there, especially if I go over a bump. Yep. But I think, like we talked about, I'm chasing gremlins now. You I am going to do ball yeah. joints and everything else. We, we've checked. He needs... Full four ball joints. They're not horrible, oh, but come they're on. I got camber like a camber down. No, 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 <laughs> yeah, uh, he does. Import. He also, whoever had the Jeep before him. I'm going to shoot. Well, you can't do that. I'm sorry. It's illegal. Uh, With a pellet gun. He put a, a drop. Uh, steering arm, pitman arm on. They installed the entire Rhymes with Ijacker lift. Yeah. And the drop pitman arm is okay if you use a corresponding drop track bar bracket to keep them parallel. No, no. Let's just drill a hole in the mount. And they just drilled a hole in the factory mount, used a aftermarket bar that is not the same as the steering linkage. Uh, which and, is a curry correct. Which is a curry correct link, but with an aftermarket <laughs> bar with a drop steer. Folks, his track bar and his um, steering linkage bar make a V. Yeah. They're supposed to be parallel, but it makes a V. Yeah. And in addition to that, the bracket that the uh, track bar goes into, the axle is showing. Signs of distress, shall we say? Yeah, uh, I think we have an upper bend control arm too. <laughs> yeah, well, that was the other thing. We were just under it today. You're showing me the bushings, and I'm laying there looking up. My I said, uh, no, 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 no. I said, yeah, I think this bottom bracket's bent because I had to hammer in the bottom <laughs> control arm, and you and you got bigger problems than that, pal. I'm like, what? <laughs> he looks up and points to my boomerang. That was my uh, front upper <laughs> control arm. I'm like, damn it! Somebody apparently in the Jeep's life um, hit a curb. That's a nice way to put it. I think he hit a tree. 
<laughs> he it's curved something. into something solid. It says the, the upper passenger side arm has a distinct uh, bow and arrow shape to it. <laughs> it has a boomerang. So your whole axle is tracking sideways, which would be the source of that kind of shimmy. Uh, well, now it's aligned properly. <laughs> it's aligned, but your thrust angle on the front axle is not in line with the thrust thrust axle on the rear and that's the center line of the rear is going due north and the south is being pushed a little bit off to one side and when you steer straight they're just they're fighting each other yeah and also the drop pitman arm too and that's the one thing that's frustrating is that the and here comes the frustrations when people and when we when and we tell people read the instructions follow them and blah 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 Mm -hmm. this lift kit was six hundred dollars brand new yeah like i said it it rhymes with hijacker and um (laughs) The shocks suck. I'm sorry. I'm going to be bluntly honest. The, well, all the control arm bushings they, they, are junk. Part of the reason they suck is they have no bushings left in there. Well, even when I put the same shocks in my YJ, and that's okay. why my kidneys are slurpy. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I got a lot of issues, folks. He does. So, uh, so now, I, I, even though I got rid of one problem horse, I have another one now that's like, you know what? I'm about to go. Scott, um, I feel your pain. You came over and helped me when I finally bit the frustration bullet and bought an entire front axle completely built uh, with new bushings, bearings, uh, ball joints, and everything. Um, By the way, that's a really nice kitchen sink you got with it. Yeah, I did. <laughs> And I paid for it, too. Ouch. Um, <laughs> Don't worry. It's only me. <laughs> um, but, no, we just have to work through yeah. those issues. And nothing. the one thing, folks, and you've heard me talk about it in previous shows, because of the short wheelbase of a, of a Jeep, particularly those like the TJs, even the LJs, which are 18 inches longer, but it's still a short wheelbase vehicle, yeah. bar none. The uh, alignment of the axles to the frame and to each other is uber, uber sensitive. Yeah. It is. You can only be, if you have an imaginary line that splits your Jeep down the middle from the grill to the tailgate, all right, and it's dead center on the frame, you can only be off from a true 90 degree angle for the rear axle and the front axle, no more than one quarter of one degree. Start thinking about that folks. Yeah. One quarter of one degree Isn't off 90. Less than a thickness of a nickel. It's something <clears throat> stupid like that. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I chased that on the front of my Jeep for ages before I finally learned it was actually my back axle causing the problem. Yeah. Uh, because that's where the power is applied when you're driving down the road, and it's trying to skew and shove the the Jeep sideways compared to what the front wheels are trying to tell it to do. We're going to make a U-turn. <laughs> so um, in Scott's case, I am believing by symptoms. We haven't gone out and measured it. But when I see a bent upper control arm, only on one side. His driver's side looks okay. A little yeah. old and dirty and rusty, but hey. Um, that he is off, and that's one old, of the- dirty, and rusty was my acapella name in college. <laughs> I thought you said it was a nickname used for me when I wasn't looking. <laughs> hey, I wouldn't do that to you. Uh, uh, it's one of the challenges that we get into yeah. with the uh, the shorter Jeep frames, whether it's a TJ, a YJ, even a CJ. Uh, the jigs that Chrysler used in the past and, and before them, uh, Jeep itself, AMC, Willys, weren't exactly screaming accurate for placement of the um, shackle mounts, you know, spring mounts, uh, arm mounts on the various models. Uh, you could have, you know, to, to be within that quarter of a degree, it could be pretty tough. And yeah. since we have fixed suspension arms on them, it doesn't take a whole lot of wear and a bushing, a ball joint to start throwing that thrust angle off. Yeah. Um, and measuring it either takes some sophisticated equipment or real patience. Um, I am cheap, so I took the real patience mode, uh, which meant I actually put a string line down the center of my Jeep <laughs> and measured about 37 times to make sure it was straight and centered between the frame rails and that I didn't have a diamond frame rail. 
and then proceeded to use the old Pythagorean theorem, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Um, figure that one out. My math hurts. <laughs> yeah, it should. Uh, or a calculator will help. And uh, I can do boobs in the calculator. <laughs> <laughs> That's an old one. Um, I hope they don't have to cut that out. <laughs> That's up to you. Um, so, and you can do that, but it involves repeated measurements, being extremely precise, double checking yourself more times than I care to imagine, uh, to A, get the axle centered. And by the way, that centering is not of the axle itself, but of the wheel discs. Right. So if you think about it, the best way to do that, if you have disc brakes, which Scott does, yeehaw, <laughs> is you take the wheels off, put the axle on, you know, on jack stands, put lug nuts on the ax on the on the rotors, and you can use the surface of the rotors as what your center to center is. Ooh, ooh. Yeah. I do have one good news though. What My brake pads are at eight millimeters up front, four in the rear, but I have good front brakes. Good. Yay. So you're able to stop it when it starts to shake <laughs> <Yes>. and shimmy. <laughs> So anyway, we're going to have to get his rear axle checked and aligned if it's not true. Yeah. And then we're going to have to go to his front. Uh, and I have a sneaking suspicion with that bent arm that his front axle is probably out of spec as far as not being 90 degrees to the center of the Jeep. So most likely, since it's the upper right that's bent a little bit, he's probably lagging a little behind on the passenger's front wheel, which means the whole axle's kind of twisted a little bit to turn right, whereas the rear end's trying to go straight. And before you say it, yes, I know everybody says, well, you just turn your wheel straight. That gives you dog tracking. Have you yeah. all been behind that old white <laughs> van? Silverado or whatever. Yeah, or whatever, whatever driving down, down the road, road. It's going down the highway kind of cockeyed. That's dog tracking, and that's because the axle axles are not parallel to each other or it's got a really badly bent frame well that's a, well that causes the same symptom the two yeah. axles are not parallel to each other uh, adjustable suspension systems are great because you can adjust that out adjustable suspension systems are a pain in the ass because you must adjust that out yeah and it's a fiddly and when i say fiddly i'm talking about okay move that one just uh quarter of a turn oh too much back up back up, back up. an eighth of a turn oh, oh, oh no tighten the lock it. oh that moved it tight untighten it move it yeah and that's exactly scott can tell you about five years ago four years ago i was cussing a blue streak you know before this podcast ever started of adjusting and readjusting and re readjusting and re <laughs> yeah re readjusting until finally one day i'm driving it and i was actually panicked because it didn't shake yeah and it's like Something's Have I died wrong. and gone to heaven? <laughs> I kept thinking something was wrong. Uh, did my steering coupling decouple? <laughs> <laughs> Let me turn. What? So, long story short on that, there's there's probably more tech than you wanted to know. <laughs> well, and again, as I chase down these gremlins, we're, we're going to let you know because, honestly, you know, we always talk about one of the questions we do get a lot is, you know, hey, I just bought this Jeep. It's got 70,000 miles. I put my lift kit on it. Now it wants to try and kill me. Yep. We talk about how, you know, you put a, a new lift, you change some angles on a worn suspension system. It's going to let you know where things have gone bad real quick. Real quick. Because you, know, <clears throat> you, you tighten up some things and the other stuff that was slop in har harmonious slop. <laughs> yeah. Now all of a sudden wants it's to kill discord, you. discord, yes. Well, and that's the thing. Like One of the customer, customers, one, one of the, the listeners, well, actually it wasn't even a listener at the time. She posted on there, you know, hey, I want to get a lift for my Jeep. What's the best lift I should get? And of course, everyone did 100 acre of what she should do. And I said, stop. Listen to what kind of Jeep do you have? Well, I have a two-door JK. Listen to this show, and I, re I referred her back to the original show we did on lift kits. Mm -hmm. And and she she messaged me back saying, "Oh wow, I didn't even think about drive shafts. I didn't even think about brake lines. I didn't even think about all this stuff because the kit I'm looking at doesn't have all this stuff. Yep. Should I still buy this kit?" And I said, "Well, try and find a kit that's complete. Yeah. If that's the kit that you can afford, there's nothing wrong with buying it." and shelving it mm -hmm. and wait till you come up with the money for the rest of the stuff. Because what will happen is you put this lift kit on, you won't be happy. You're going to blame the lift kit. Mm -hmm. And next thing you know, you're, it, it's, you're going to be chasing all these gremlins in a vehicle you can't drive. Right now, it's your only way to work. Why don't you wait till you get everything else checked out first? Yeah. And, you know, there's, that's the thing that we talked about in the show is that, you know, lift kits can affect brake lines, as he said. They can affect drive shafts, uh, transfer cases, exhaust systems. Um, there's just a whole host of things. Uh, how many people out there, unless you drive a TJ and you've learned it the hard way, think about your shifter 
for your transfer case. That's why I got got rid of the transfer case drop on mine is because I can't get into reverse. I right. have to manually hold that that half well, a that's day. Your I transmission. Had it. I'm talking about though the transfer uh, cases. Well, I know, but like when I had it uh, lifted up, mm-hmm. uh, reverse is a dream to get into. Yeah, it would be. <laughs> so all of those things are affected as a direct side effect, for lack of a better word, of which lift you choose and how complete it is. Yeah. Um, I'll be honest, I haven't seen any that were absolutely 100% perfect as far as having everything you needed, nut and bolt. However, the best ones tell you you'll need to do an SYE and replace your drive shaft. Yeah. They don't include it, but they at least forewarn you that you're going to need that it. You're gonna need it. Yeah. Um, you know, a transfer case drop may be required for vehicles with really short drive shafts. Uh, standard TJs, particularly those with a, a high pinion, okay, they're probably going to need it because if you look at that, it's a, what did you call it, Scott? Play school, my first drive shaft. Yeah, a little little <laughs> tiny <laughs> thing. Tiny little <laughs> drive shaft. <laughs> you know. your good little drive shaft. <laughs> I'm going to spray you with Miracle Grow, and you'll be a big one one day. <clears throat> okay, that's getting strange. Um, <laughs> uh, but you know, in my case. I did a very nice lift. The problem with my metal cloak lift, we've made no high uh, about that, that that's what I went with. But because of the very large amount of down travel that lift gives, it you really do have to get a short uh, uh, transfer case uh, slip yoke eliminator kit and a long splined drive shaft. And I still had to, just because of the geometries of my personal TJ, and they vary from model to model, uh, I had to go with a one-inch uh, transmission drop. Um, I could have fought around it with some other things, but I was actually reaching drive shaft bind in the uh, universal joints at full droop. The, the, the down travel was so extreme. The other option would have been to get a, sh- a shorter shock with a, with a more limiting travel that I couldn't get that far down. But I wanted that down travel. I wanted that real extreme articulation. So I had to sacrifice a little bit of central center clearance by dropping the the skid pan. Well, when you drop the skid pan, now my shifter link hitch to the transfer (laughs) case was wonky. It didn't want to engage because the upper end bolts to the body and the bottom end bolts to the transfer case. So that necessitated changing that out with a savvy uh, cable shifter because it doesn't care about that relationship. And yaddy, cool. yaddy, yaddy, yeah. yaddy, yaddy. Uh, that led to longer vent hoses for the transmission and the transfer case, which fortunately I had a simple reroute allowed me to have enough slack to get my speedometer cable and uh, you know the electrical speedometer feed and the backup light feeds and all that stuff plugged in. So, folks, you know, it's funny how modifying your Jeep. And then we've done three years on this subject. Yeah. You know, one idea can lead to a dozen <laughs> different projects yeah. to get your Jeep back up to where it operates the way you want it to. And, and, and you know. it's very interesting because uh, the $35 front control arm bushings that my Jeep desperately needed ca- caused, caused me all this headache. Yeah. You know? Yep. And you don't think about that. You think, okay, I'm doing good. I'm putting stuff back together the way it should. And like we talked about, worn components harmoniously wear together. And next thing you know, you got the new kid on the block. I don't like you. Everyone out. <laughs> you <Yeah. know? laughs> and you're dying on the highway. Yeah. Well, really, and, and uh, well, it's still, folks, we, we have the same issues that you do. I mean, right now I enjoy my Jeep. I, I've fought with it for four years and mm-hmm. and did my research and beat myself silly and made mistakes, which is why I try to share with you. <laughs> and it drives really, really nice, yes. and it corners nice and stable. I meant to ask you, when we came into the to the compound on the way in, were, were you, did you see the guy behind me kind of tailgating me? Yeah, the little uh, black uh, the, SVT Focus. Yeah, the, he had his turbos, and every time he pulled up to me here, yeah. I was just curious, since I made a rather rapid right turn into the community, did I lift my rear tire up? It felt like it. You didn't lift your rear tire up, but I think they were rather surprised you were able to make that turn like that. <laughs> Because it was kind of like because they started slowing down, thinking you're going to slow down. You went right through, and I'm going, "Wow, Kevin!" I uh, 
there's a technique and if you have ever run scca sports cars you learn about deep braking and then let off the brake and actually accelerate into a corner and you know i don't recommend it for jeeps because they have a habit of rolling over and playing dead uh <laughs> but i and i've done it once or twice and actually picked the rear tire up off the ground cornering and i was like i heard some chirping under there i, was like, I wonder if i lost it but otherwise the guy was going to be coming in and doing an up close inspection of my spare tire <laughs> <laughs> you're going to inflate their airbags <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah, I, I probably don't drive a Jeep the way most people should. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm desperately trying to keep up, keep up with you and not burn my clutch out the rest of the way. I'm going, damn it, Kevin, you know I don't know where I am, right? Yeah, well, I wait for you at every turn. <clears throat> yes, I have to the chagrin of the guy in the SVT focus behind you going, oh, crap, oh, crap, oh, crap, oh, crap. <laughs> Stopping. <laughs> Oh, yeah, everybody says, you need to get 35s or, or, or 38s on that Jeep. No, I don't. Nope. Nope, 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 nope. I don't want my center of gravity any higher than I have to. <laughs> and it's more fun to do it this way. It is. It's more fun to be underestimated. I've always exactly. said that before, on both on the trail and on the road. <laughs> Some people wait till their turbo to spool up. You wait for the Ram Air effect on your River Raider uh, snorkel. Uh huh. Uh huh. You got it. <laughs> exactly. Someday I ought to put an air pressure gauge on that just to see what kind of you know pseudo boost I get from uh, from Ram Scoop. Hey, no, no time like the present, right? Come on, you want a boost gauge? I know you do. I know you do. I know you do. I know you do. <laughs> I'm like that little devil that sits on your shoulder. Nah, she won't know. Go ahead and do it. Come on, chicken. <laughs> And I'm going to go, and you need to replace faulty components and worn out components. You know you do, because they're going to kill you if you don't. So you really and ought I to am. do it, too. And I am. Well, Not eventually. But you don't need to let them season in the in the garage for a nine months before you put them on. No, when I, when I get the lift, that's going right on. Oh, when I get the lift. Always conditional. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You know, people don't want to hear my problems. So, uh, yeah, they but, do. <laughs> hey, we'd like to hear your problems. Yeah, we would. On on the trail podcast at gmail.com. And while you're sending out that email, and doing all that kind of really kind stuff to ask Kevin and I some hopefully really cool technical questions. Remember to take a few minutes out from our last little bonus show to, again, spread the love with some of those local businesses. Yep. You know, just pick one. Doesn't matter. You know, again, we have a ton of them around the Tampa Bay area between... You but know, you got to have them all around your area too. Yes, I keep keep reminding Scott that you know even though we broadcast here out of Tampa, we talk to Jeeps around the world. Mm -hmm. So whether you're here, whether you're in Canada, whether you're uh, California, our friends in well, that almost is another country, isn't it? Yeah, uh, they're good. You know, well, again, ho hopefully we are still a country by the time this show comes out. It is April 1st. Oh, well, yeah. Hopefully we have a country left. Uh, we will. Uh, you, but, uh, if anything, we are very, very, very resilient. We are. We are. Especially both as, as a people in this country as well as a, a group of Jeepers, you know. And uh, I kind of figure the last thing, you know, bumping over the road towards the end of the world will probably be a Jeep. <laughs> yep. And you know, the, probably the last thing says as those two Jeeps passed... Why didn't you wave? So with that, we're going to go ahead and... Uh... Well, I'm sorry. You, you just reminded me of a joke I saw. Uh -oh. And this one was classic. You know how the, the Mars rover finally stopped transmitting? No. You know, it kind of... it's Yeah. The, the, the last messages that came from whichever one it was, it was the, the one that just died up there. Okay. And somebody said, you know, they made one mistake. All it needed was a Jeep badge on it and it would still be running. <laughs> <laughs> it might not be running well, but it's still running. <laughs> And over here we have Mars rover check engine light. Yes. But it's still running. It's still running, you know. <laughs> if you look at a clear night sky on the Mars, you can see the orange glow of a check engine light. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> All right. What else you got? Uh, I got nothing really, man. I, I think we've done enough damage. To you. It's been here almost an hour and these it people has. are probably going, oh my God, get with the fart jokes. But what did we say the other day? Uh, you're smart and I'm fart. <laughs> God help us. <laughs> <laughs> they do in mysterious ways. Well, again, we hope everybody out there with the LJs and the Gladiators and a manual transmission, pay attention to your rig. Yes. Make Look for those warning symptoms. Um, the rest of you with automatics, don't panic. It doesn't apply to you. <laughs> yeah. They, 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 uh, don't, it, it, the rest of us automatics are 42, you know, yeah. life, universe, and what is it? Life, the universe, and everything. Exactly. <laughs> and thank so long. Thanks for all the fish. Exactly. Um, and on the other hand, for those of you with the Gladiator, it is a mid-sized truck, mm -hmm. not a monster truck. Um, you know, 
treat it within its design limits. You have a little book they gave you that's usually stored somewhere in the center console or the glove box, and it'll give you some bits of information that would really be nice to know. All right, I'll read it already. <laughs> Jeez. Well, you don't have to read it all the way through. I'm just saying, you know, you've actually done better than most, Scott. You know, you've looked at what the tow rating was. Yeah. You've looked at what the gross vehicle weight is, the gross vehicle combined weight is, you know, and those are some numbers that if you don't exceed, you probably shouldn't, you know, fold, bend, spindle, or mutilate your uh, your gladiator. Exactly. Um, and uh, but it says we'll, nothing about mall, not mall in the parking lot, but mall. I was say, are you mall, mall parking now? Yeah, I thought we're not supposed to be. Is it M A U L? I don't know. Yes, it's M A U L. Okay, I'm all uh, that joke. So, folks, we will uh, we will let you go and and look forward to more because I'm going to continue to quiz him on a Did you ever get to drive the Gladiator yet? <laughs> you know, solo without your wife, and B We got to get it off road one of these days and see how it handles. I want to do a uh, citrus run. I just understand that the wife's like, but 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 but. <laughs> so, but I've noticed she's starting to get really psyched about it. Yes. She's already getting. You know, from the, I want a new Jeep, I'm not going to do any mods, to, oh, I, I really would like to do this. Oh, I, I really want to do that. Yeah. So, so far, they've been cheap things, which I'm okay with. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know. Yeah, I know. It too I will come. know. You know, a Jeep with no mods is like giving your daughter a Barbie drawl with only one dress. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you do to your enemies. No. Your enemies, you give them a toy that makes noise. I've always given drum sets, little tiny drum sets. Oh, people must hate you. I don't have any friends, <laughs> with the exception of you. And your daughter's full grown. Yeah. <laughs> and on that note, folks, I think it's time we uh, put the Jeep in four low and hit the trail. Yeah, and I'm actually going to lock the manual hubs. Yeah, that, that's good. I'm going to sit there and hopefully mine don't rust apart. No, that could be. <laughs> that could be. All right, folks, we, uh, we hope you enjoyed the show. Yes. We'll be back in another two weeks, we hope. Mm -hmm. um, life uh, and... and uh, Everything willing. Yeah, CVID-19. <laughs> no, no, that's 25 cents in the square jar. That's true. That's true. So, everybody, uh, as we always say, it's time for us to lock hubs, hit the trails. Um, Take nothing but paper. I had to do it once. See, I went through all the shows and doing really good, and all of a sudden, I just go, blah. Take nothing but paper. Pit. <laughs> no, hey, no, folks. no, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Take well, you see other word. Take nothing but pictures, memories, and your trash when you leave the trail. Or photographs is fine, which is maybe he won't stumble on so bad. I'll stumble on anything. Oh, that's true. All right, folks. Uh, till the next time of On the Trail with Kevin and Scott. I'm Kevin. I'm Bye. Scott. Bye. Proceeding has been provided for entertainment only. Proper service and repair procedures are vital to the safe, reliable operation of all motor vehicles, as well as personal safety of those performing those repairs. Standard safety procedures and precautions, including the use of safety goggles and proper tools and equipment, should be followed at all times to eliminate the possibility of personal injury or improper service which could damage the vehicle or compromise its safety. What he said. <laughs> Thanks a lot for listening, guys. You guys have a great day. Bye. <laughs>